So good evening to everyone. Can you hear me on the last row? Okay, cool. Uh, so good evening to everyone. I'm Martin. Uh, sorry for my accent. I hope uh, you can get at least <laughs> some words from my talk. Um, I am. I've been working for uh, as a data engineer, data scientist as well, and uh, as a data consultant for many years. So I'm, I'm really uh, a data believer, and I'm, I consider myself as a data person. And currently, I'm CTO and co-founder of Infinite Lambda, which is a data consultancy. And today, I'm going to talk about new to uh, about uh, event-driven data lake and infrastructure as cost concept, especially in the UK uh, at the UK e-commerce. How many of you have been working for any kind of e-commerce industry? Oh, that's quite a lot. Okay, thanks. Um, don't don't worry if you're not, because. Uh, the main takeaways and the main principles of my talk will be general enough to uh, adopt this kind of principles into any kind of industry. The reason why I'm talking about e-commerce is now it's easier to um, basically uh, put this into practice and it's, it's easier to visualize or easier to uh, understand the main concepts. So imagine ourselves as a, as a client and service provider uh, situation. So we are the service provider. We would like to uh, give us a service uh, for a data platform. So we ask questions about the clients. Uh, I want to collect everything in one place, a typical requirement, right? So we would like to uh, implement a data platform. And also, I would like to validate my data and my use case in a quick iterations. Um, so I would like to have a data lake or warehouse, or both of them, or just one of them. I don't really know what's the difference. How many of you working in data space? Data engineer, data scientist, analyst? Not that many. OK, so maybe it's worth to just mention just really shortly what's the difference. So warehouse, maybe data warehouse is more common because it's uh, also coming from the stem energy from the traditional um, data warehouse and database concepts. So warehouse is where we store our data in a, in a structural form. And we also use data modeling on the top of the storage. Meanwhile, in Data Lake, we don't do and, and don't apply any kind of transformation. We just store, store our data in an original format. And we have the tool set. We have the tool set to get the insights. And we, have, we are able to do quicker iterations of my data insights. So the two together can work together. And um, to be honest, it's, it's the best if they both exist. And the Data Lake can, for example, be a staging environment for, for the warehouse. All right, um, it's already already still in, in the requirements collection phase. So the client says that I'm in AWS. Um, for, we are in the AWS meetup, for sure. But it's still a key decision point, because some of the clients, uh, it or it's not logged in already in, in uh, not, sorry, not in, logged in yet in AWS. So maybe the requirements is to be cloud agnostic. So in this case, the architecture design and the components, what I'm going to use is totally different. So, but this client is already logged into AWS. So it's already filtered out lots of my, uh, basically, freedom, what, how to design uh, the data platform. This is going to be a stream platform, as uh, opposed to batch. It's an other, obviously, uh, um, decision, a key decision point in my uh, design phase. And I would like to be serverless. That was a really strict requirements and he and uh, the client was really confident about that he wants to do, he want to do serverless so as we are in a AWS meetup I think most of you uh, basically aware of what is serverless basically um, we want to choose components which doesn't have any operational warehouse all right so we are the service provider it's pretty sounds pretty easy we have some components already not all of it is here in the board but it's just a puzzle, right? So it's a, like a game. We put it everything together, and we are done. Uh, just out of curiosity, and to go back to the more like for the use case, what do we want to store in the data? So that's more the e-commerce uh, perspective, uh, how a data platform and, and the data generation could look like. Um, so imagine that I have a, the e-commerce. I have a website where I want to sell my product. I'm already using Google Analytics. Um, but I'm pretty sure that I can be better. Uh, I can enrich my data, for example, which is cannot be done in Google Analytics. And also, um, 
there is different concept, there is different definition what I, I would like to adopt. So like I have different session definition, so I would like to import all of my Google Analytics data, for example, in my platform. Also, if the case is that I have custom JavaScript application embedded in my website, then uh, I have custom event uh, generation, basically. So that could be an also good example from, from the browser side. So basically, in, in one word, I want to be event-driven. Um, so event-driven, this kind of concept is not only applies for, for the browser-generated data, it, only of, of applies, it also applies for internal data, but I'm gonna talk about this later. So for example, I have a button, shop now, add, add to basket, so I'm gonna generate uh, really specific events and really custom events and everything, every kind of user interaction basically on my website uh, is trackable and I can create this kind of events. All right, uh, so let's start the journey. Let's start from really bare minimum, right? So what what I would like to do, uh, I would like to design this platform. I'm, there is two things what I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that I, I need a bucket uh, as a storage layer, that's, my, that's gonna be in the data lake. And I'm pretty sure that I'm gonna need an Amazon API gateway because all of my, because based on the requirements, uh, all of the event is basically browser generated. What is the component, what are the components between of these two? It's still a question mark. Um, obviously, um, function, yeah, it can be, but uh, every, everybody feels that it's, it's not really robust, it's not scalable. Uh, so pretty sure that I have to have a, a buffer solution or a micro batch solution because, because then it's not gonna be scalable. Pretty sure that I, I, I would like to have uh, a Kinesis stream, for example, which gives me the robustness and the scalability of, of the platform. And uh, how, how is going forward? Um, I, I, I need a component which is then store, store my data in optimal format. So my, my end goal is that store my data and then using serverless solutions like uh, Athena, uh, Amazon Athena or Spectrum, I would like to have, uh, I would like to execute basically auto queries and aggregation queries for BI tools. Uh, so I would like to use, I would like to store my data in, in parquetized format. And also I would like to use uh, partitions. So typically this kind of events is time series events and I would like to use the date as a partition. So pretty straightforward uh, solution would be EMR. So I have a sparse streaming application. I'm gonna um, basically handle all, all kinds of events in, in, in one Spark application. I'm gonna store each of every uh, event in different, form, in different folder in S3. But remember that one of the first requirements was to be serverless. So um, EMR, it's, it's a managed service, but on top of that, there is the Spark application, especially the streaming application, which is not really straightforward. So I wouldn't <coughs> call it as a really a serverless component. Okay, let's, let's think forward. Uh, what is the serverless component which is able, enable me to, to store uh, in a parquetized format and in a, in a partition format my, my data? So this is the Amazon uh, Kinesis Firehose where each of every piece of uh, fire hose can store basically one, kind, one event type into one specific folder. So if I have 10 kinds of events, sorry, 10 kinds of event types, I need 10 Kinesis fire hose. In this case, I'm just uh, visualizing two. Um, there is still a, a question mark between the Kinesis stream and the fire hose. I, I, I need a routing function. Uh, what kind of functions can I use here to, in order to achieve this routing? Let's think about, for example, the analytics, Kinesis Analytics. Uh, I read an article that somebody is routing by Kinesis Analytics using SQL, because analytics is a SQL interface on top of the stream, and I can write basic SQL query that uh, select everything from that event and putting everything to Firehose. Um, can be a solution, but everybody feels that it's basically this tool is not really uh, designed for that, and uh, I don't feel that much um, space for customizing this kind of application. So let's think about forward. Um, what if if I have a lambda there, and I'm using a DynamoDB as a business logic store storage, where I could say that whenever an event comes in, I want to 
check a specific field, and I want to route the specific, based on the specific field, I want to route it to specific firehose. So I'm gonna store this routing here, here in the DynamoDB, and I'm using the Lambda function to read out and basically compare the content of the events and the, and the content of the, on the DynamoDB table. So that sounds pretty cool, that sounds reasonable, so uh, that can be my routing function. Uh, by the way, this, this code, uh, the, this Lambda code, uh, is already kind of provided by AWS because AWS has lots of blueprints, which is uh, provided to the customers. Uh, it's, to be more specific, it's a fan out function, which means that uh, all of the incoming events is coming to each of every fire host. We had to modify it in a way that I want to uh, route one event type into one, one specific fire host. So basically, I mentioned that I'm gonna check the content of the message. What does it mean? It means that I have to have a field, a mandatory field, which is about, which is uh, basically gonna be the basics of, of my routing logic. Uh, so this, this kind of mandatory fields can be applied, can be enforced uh, on this architecture using the API gateway, because API gateway has this concept of model where I can define schema and I can say rules that, all right, I would like to uh, have event type as a monetary field, and whenever the event doesn't have any event type field, then I'm gonna reject the message. So basically, I would like to adopt uh, a, a message wrapper on the top of my content, on the top of my uh, message, so it is, I'm gonna be sure that each of every message has a, has a the, monetary field, and it should work. <sighs> All right, uh, before we go forward, let's ask the clients, are we done here? Requirements prospect? <laughs> All right, <laughs> Java, of course. So, getting back, the client is really disturbing. So, are we done here? Yeah, uh, of course, of course not. So, actually, we have inter internal messages as well. So. So far, what we have designed is, 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 is a good uh, design for ex uh, external messages, let's call it external messages, which is the browser-generated messages. Uh, actually, we have internal messages as well. What does it mean, internal messages? So I have microservices, microservices communicating through bus, b uh, internal bus system. I have messages captured through the CRM system. I have uh, actually one of the most uh, typical example is the database change data capture. Uh, so basically what I mentioned to you at the beginning about the event driven, this event driven concept can be applied on the internal messages as well. So I capture every data and every information change basically. Every information change for me is, a, is an event for me and I would like to capture it. By the way, we were like, uh, when the clients change the requirements, so um, that's kind of the reaction what we can have in this case. Uh, so let's, let's think about it. Uh, where, where should we wire uh, the internal messages? There are multiple options. Um, we came up with a solution to, to wire, uh, so that the messages, message bu buses and the internal message system is coming through SNS. So what we have to do is we have to wire uh, the messages from SNS into the Kinesis stream, which means that basically from the data platform point of view, this is a single po point of um, um, ingress basically to this uh, platform. And from this point of view, it's totally message agnostic or uh, message source agnostic that what kind of message I'm, I'm receiving. It can be even an external messages which is generated by a browser or it can be uh, any kind of messages which is coming through the internal uh, system. And, and, the, and the, rest of the, the rest of the workflow is basically the same. So uh, the same concept. All right, theory, theory reverse, let's try it in practice. Problem, fir first problem. Um, so I choose Kinesis Firehose bec because this meant to be a tool to store, store my data in a way, in an optimized way, in a parketized way, in a partition way, then which is gonna be really optimized for, for any kind of query engine, which is, at, it can be Athena or Spectrum. Uh, 
the glue between of them is AWS Glue, which is a Hive, con Hive uh, Metastore implementation of AWS. And Hive Metastore database has a strict um, syntax uh, for, for example, the partitions uh, field. Or for example, in this case, of, uh, if we want to partition our data in, in date, date time, then year equal, month equal, day equal. So what is my output of my Kinesis Firehose? Obviously not that. Um, so it's, um, I don't know what they thought when AWS released this kind of component, but it really feels me that they kind of st starting to build this kind of bridge, but there is no pin meeting point at the, at the middle. So it's total nonsense. Um, I'll show you our reaction on this, because um, uh, Kinesis Firehose was released in 2015, and uh, actually, this, when this slide or uh, this platform was basically done, it was last year, uh, 2018 December. Uh, Kinesis Firehose released a fix for that in 2018 Christmas, <laughs> by the way. It was uh, 20th of December. So basically, they took basically, it was three years to fix that issue. So uh, it's a total nonsense for me uh, why, why they released this kind of components if kind of not usable. Uh, so by the way, they fixed it uh, last year, end of last year, but uh, still, I'm, not, I'm still not 100% uh, satisfied because even if I have the structure of the, the syntax, I still have more requirements. For example, I'm not 100% sure that I want to partition my data based on the current date time. What if I want to, um, what if I want to backfill my data? And let's say I'm receiving event now, but my event is generated last year, because it's backfilled, and I want to part, uh, I want to have my partitions based on a different uh, field, so I want to based on one of the content. <sighs> All right, uh, let's go forward. Uh, second problem. Um, so I already told you about this wrapper. So we're gonna. We, this is the payload itself. This is the the the, the pure message itself, and I applied already the the wrapper around it. So that's a nasty schema. How does it look like on the other side uh, of the architecture? So on, on glue, on from database perspective, it's gonna be three column. In this case, event time, event type, and data payload. Let's see how the data types is. So the first one has a timestamp data type, second one has a string primitive data type, the third one has a really strange data type. It's, it's a structure of user ID action uh, timestamp object type. All right, strange, I've never seen that before, but okay, let's not worry about this now. Uh, later on, what happens if a user, basically, or the, or the data science team who is working with this uh, message, would like to add a new field on this? So I'm gonna add the new field here. How does it look like on the other side? It's gonna be, let's say, I'm, I'm, I'm adding a new field which is username, which is a string. So this is my new column, but my I, I changed my data type. So it's not anymore a structure of user ID actions timestamp object type, it's additionally, it has a username. What's the problem with this? When I would like to query the, the new data, schema mismatch exception. So basically, um, Athena cannot handle any kind of data changes, which is not customable from, from the previous to the next. Um, okay, no, don't worry about it. Let's find a workaround. Now, what, what is the workaround for that? The workaround went before we um, store basically the data, we're gonna use a transformation on the data. The transformation is the following, is basically a flattening function. So I have a nested scheme on the left side, and I'm gonna basically flatten the nested uh, structure, and I'm gonna bring up everything into the top. So let's see how it's gonna look like. Now, now I have each of every field type is a separate column. So when I adding a new uh, field here, it's gonna be a new column on the, l on the right side. So, and it's not anymore a schema mismatch exception because that's um, from Athena or from Spectrum perspective, it's a, it's a handled solution. If, you, if I'm uh, adding new columns, it's, it's, it's a customable solution. All right. Uh, I'm still on, on the second problem and I already have restrictions for the platform. I have restrictions that if I have uh, extra, trans extra information, I have to use a flattening function because I can, the extra information should be added as an extra field. 
So existing field type cannot be modified, cannot be changed, because as I showed you this structure format, or if I'm using a custom modifiable structure, uh, which is like this one, uh, this, can, this is really similar if, if somebody's familiar with BigQuery, because um, BigQuery and, and Google Analytics using this kind of structure for the custom dimensions. I don't know if anybody's ever about this. So basically it's a list of arrays, and uh, uh, sorry, uh, array, uh, array of structures, where my structure is a value name and value, for example, and it's extendable. So it doesn't matter how, how much uh, element I have in, a, in, in my array, uh, basically uh, this structure format is, is not changed, and I can, I'm flexible as much as, I can, as much as I can. The only problem is that on the, on the query side, when I want to query this or when I, get, I want to get some insight from the data, then um, it's, a, it's a bit hard. It's not really convenient to, to query this kind of stru uh, structure format. All right. We already uh, reached the point where we want to think about how to deploy this whole stuff. Um, so CloudFormation is, can be a solution, uh, but there are really annoying problems, to be honest, and again with this fire hose. Um, if I want to pro uh, provision a fire hose instance, then not, so basically uh, CloudFormation is a, is a kind of native language to AWS. So I'm really expecting that every kind of feature which Kinesis Fire has, has is, already ex is also exposed to CloudFormation level. But that's not the case. For example, conversion and the backup uh, configuration, it cannot be set up CloudFormation. It, they just simply not exposed to that level. So if I want to do, if, if I want to set up correctly without any manual, uh, basically without, I, I don't want to do, uh, I don't want to provision a, an instance and I want to go and then go to the console and I click manually, I mean, because it's nonsense. Uh, so I have to do some additional scripting, I have to do some API call. So this is also a uh, really mm, annoying thing of cloud formation. All right, let's calm down. And before we start implementing, mm, just for, be sure, let's again, the client, if everything's right now, we are redundant done right now. No, uh, don't forget that we want to have a self-service even deployment, so we don't have a bottleneck of data engineering team. So the reaction of, do you know already the reaction when, when the client changes the requirements? It's even worse. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, Serve, uh, if you think about uh, from the client perspective, to be self-service, it's it's a really important and really interesting principle. So maybe in, in your organization or maybe in your experience, you already had this kind of um, situation when uh, somebody requires a new data or somebody requires a schema change, for example, data in their platform. So they have to go to the data engineering team, they have to ask them, they have to, uh, you have to open a ticket for them, and if they are not that busy, or depends on the priority, of course, uh, it takes a long time. So there is, it could be like weeks, months, or even more, depends on the organization, depends on the company. But if you think about it, it's, it's a really valuable time. Uh, we are losing really valuable time from the business. Because for this time, I can't go forward with my use case, I can't validate my data, Maybe two, two months later, it turns out that my, my use case is not valid anymore because, because of other reasons. So to be self-service, I think it's a really nice principle and really elegant principle. So uh, let's think about it, how, how we can do that. So that's kind of obvious that we have to have everything infrastructure as code because the self-service lifecycle can, only, can be only achieved by, by CI, CD. So first, uh, Everything with what we have in, in the left side is, is the from the resource perspective. We have to set, we have to use a tool. We have to provision that all resources, and I, as I already mentioned to you and pointed to you before, that we have ad additional things what we have to do on top of the provision because it's not handled by the cloud formation, for example, or it's 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 a bit extra or, or a really custom thing. So, for example, if I want to release a new event type, I have to provision a new fire hose because I already told you that for each event type I need a new fire hose. Um, 
uh, for each of the fire hose, I have to set up it correctly. I already mentioned it to you that it's not 100% uh, uh, supported by CloudFormation. I have to insert the new accordingly to the new event type or the, to the new message. I have to insert a new uh, record into DynamoDB. I also have to subscribe to, sorry, I forget to, so I, I have to also subscribe, if it's an internal message, I have to subscribe to the SNS topic. So let's think about it. Uh, what kind of uh, tool set, what we can choose from? So I already told you many times, CloudFormation is still a, uh, an option and which we have to think about. The next one, which is SAM. Uh, SAM is meant to be the serverless kind of, uh, so it's a wrapper service from, from AWS, which is meant to be to deploy uh, serverless te components. Uh, it's far away, far away from our, our expectation, it's far away from what we want to achieve, for example, this specific example. So it's, it's, um, it's not working for us. Uh, third tool can be Terraform. It's, it's more interesting than the previous ones because Terraform using totally different uh, concepts. So Terraform using uh, API calls instead of uh, CloudFormation. Um, but still not 100% uh, covers our use cases. So finally, we ended up having our own deployment tool, which is basically a Python tool, which is uh, we went back to the, to the roots. So we're gonna use CloudFormation, but in a more enhanced way, and we're gonna use basically uh, a wrapper around CloudFormation. So how it's gonna be, how, how it can be, if I want to visualize that tool, you can you can think about this a pyramid. On the on the lower abstraction upper abstraction layer, I'm gonna have one to one mapping for each of every services, and I'm gonna generate. So I'm not writing any kind of CloudFormation code. I'm generating the CloudFormation code based on my own configuration file. Uh, the higher we going up to this abstraction layer, on the top layer. Um, so the higher we going up, the basically the less uh, code, the less configuration I need. Uh, on the top of that, for example, I, I ended up with that simple, uh, for example, YAML file. So if you think about just, I, I just need, so from business perspective, uh, what, what do I need when I'm talking about the event? So I just, basically I just need an event name. I want to specify the type, is it external or internal? And I want to define the schema. So this is a language which, which is basically editable and creatable and um, understandable for any kind of uh, person in my organization. So it can be business person, it can be data scientist, it can be analyst, uh, it, it's understandable by anybody. So I, mm, what I wanted to say here more, I don't know, maybe later on it's coming to my mind back. All right, so let's see how's it going in practice. Uh, I have Bill, he's a data scientist, a really smart guy. He working with data, he's working with data and he would like to have a new event or he would like to change an already existing uh, event schema. So what Bill does basically is Bill creates a PR. I already showed you before this YAML configuration, it's a really understandable, it's really easy to edit, really easy to create. So Bill creates a PR, a pull request for us, for a data engineering team. So uh, the, the only work for data engineering team is to check and approve that kind of, that PR, just to be sure that, uh, that the syntax is, is correct. And then after the approval, the, it, it triggers the life cycle, it triggers the CI CD. So we are using the serverless uh, CI CD components of AWS, which is the code pipeline and the code deploy. Um, that's gonna deploy our infrastructure first or, or test environment. On a test environment, we're gonna run first or unit test because it's a, it's a custom deployment tool. So I want to be sure that uh, all of my code which is written is unit tested first. Secondly, I want, because it's a custom tool, I want to be sure that all of the components I'm, or all of the resources I'm gonna provision, it's integrated correctly, so I'm gonna have an integration test then. Uh, thirdly, I w uh, once it's done, uh, I would like to uh, deploy into my UAT environment, 
and I, I'm, I'm going to do perform an end-to-end -end test, which means that Bill created uh, a schema for me, for me. I'm gonna generate a dummy event based on the schema, and I'm gonna play basically my game. So I'm gonna send this in on the input side, and I'm gonna read it on the output side. If, if I'm reading the same, what I, I just sent it before as an input, then my end-to-end -end test, end -to -end test wor works. So I'm pretty sure that what I'm gonna deploy now to prod, it's, it's, uh, it's test is tested already, so it's pretty sure that it's gonna be works. Uh, so that's that's how we basically provide a smooth uh, deployment of of our production. Because remember, it's a it's a streaming platform. If we can't afford any kind of uh, outage, if we have an outage of one minute, then we we could already lost like millions of messages. So once once it's deployed to prod, um, basically whenever the new event comes into the platform it's already exposed to Bill, and Bill can read it, and already start, uh, basically, starting his works, or he can start the data inside activities, etc. So Bill is happy, he can see all the changes, so obviously, be like Bill. All right, uh, as a recap, I would like to just, uh, I would like to just emphasize the, the, the main principles, or the main the key decision point, what you have to, uh, really have to clarify with your client whenever you are at the beginning of the journey of uh, designing this kind of platform. So the event-driven journey starting, <laughs> um, we have to be clarify about the cloud provider lock-in, uh, whether if it's a requirement or not. We want to be cloud agnostic do because it's obviously um, filtering uh, our uh, possible um, architecture scenarios. Um, serverless, it's um, obviously a client decision. It's a really nice um, principle. Basically, when we look at this platform, it's uh, if you see, if you look at this platform, so every kind of components is serverless. So basically, no operation needed. Uh, Self-service, I already talked about this uh, life cycle. It's a really nice, so from, um, so it's a, it's a really nice um, principle what we can use. It's really basically tries and drives the business to have quicker iterations. So the business, the, the data insights can be mined earlier and all the use cases can be validated earlier. Um, infrastructure as code, it's not, for my perspective, it's not really a key decision point because anyway, in 2019, you have to have your infrastructure as code because that's how the, <laughs> where the world going, I think. Uh, if, we, if, I, if I have already infrastructure code, then it also coming as a consequence that I can apply CI, CD, which is basically uh, gives me robustness and smoothness in the, in the deployment. Um, and in this way, I can uh, deploy my stream even driven platform. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Martin. Um, since we don't have much time, uh, we'll just have time for one very simple question, and then you staying with us for food downstairs? Yeah, cool. cool. Anyone has one question? <laughs> no? Maybe my colleague has. Can you ask him? <laughs> Custom resources. What, sorry, what is the question? Uh, not custom resources. So the resources, everything is uh, basically AWS many services. Where and for the provisioning this kind of services, we, I mean we are use CloudFormation, but not we are not not uh, we manually write in the CloudFormation. We had this custom deployment tool which is generating the CloudFormation based on the configuration file what I just showed you. So it's a really high level of abs abstraction. Or from the user side, it's a, it's a really high level and easily understandable by everybody. Because if you compare it to the CloudFormation resource, you know how complicated is it. So it's only for pure DevOps or data engineering team. Um, mm, basically, this um, multiple layer of assertion uh, drives us to achieve this. I don't know if it uh, makes sense or uh, I answered your question. Uh, 
yes, uh, basically we call it as an action, but yes, uh, you're right. So um, it, it, it basically does two things. One is the resource provisioning, and the other is the missing part, which is API calls, uh, any kind of scripts, but everything is handled in, with, uh, in one, one layer. Cool. Um, if you have more questions, sorry, um, I've got to release the room at 8.30. Um, but the room downstairs is available and has food we've got uh, delivered. So thank you again, Martin. Welcome. Welcome.